things. Um, and we are so excited about the, the content today. Um, we will be talking about the neuroscience of pain and understanding pain and the importance of explaining pain to patients. Um, also, trauma-informed care, specifically um, trauma-informed care um, within chronic pain. Uh, also, practical tools. Um, uh, practical tools for addressing um, pain and um, for patients and their providers. And we'll be sending you some resources um, that are free for education and for mindfulness and movement. Um, and the idea behind today's event really started when um, a few of us at HIF went to a conference in San Francisco and we saw Kate Schottmeyer present on the neuroscience of chronic pain. And it really shifted the way that some of us who organized this event think about chronic pain. Um, and it was super inspiring and we hope that you enjoy it as much today as uh, we did in September. Kate Schottmeyer is a physical therapist, a program coordinator, and an educator. Um, and she got her degree from Washington University. She works at the San Francisco um, VA Medical Center. <clears throat> um, she provides both group and individual treatments to veterans who are suffering from multipsychotic pain, as well as comorbid um, mental health conditions. And um, she is a certified pain educator and has a passion for teaching people about pain. And her goals for teaching people about pain are to um, reduce fear in patients with persistent pain, to improve movement, and to improve confidence. And also to um, improve the clinical skills of providers who care for people with chronic pain and to shift the culture in medicine around um, the stigma around chronic pain. Um, and Kate believes that uh, chronic pain and persistent pain can change and that education is actually therapy. Um, so welcome, Kate. Um, thank you. I'm starting a timer for myself because I'm the type that can talk and talk and if I don't keep tabs on it, we'll be here all day. So thank you all for being here. This is a lovely conference center and I was excited to be invited to come speak. Um, and I understand that a lot of you work together. It's a sort of a friendly community. <laughs> you know each other. And I think that's wonderful. The more contact you have with your colleagues and the more you can share knowledge and reinforce what you learn, I think our patients are going to be all better off. Um, so Cedra, thank you for the introduction. And I'm very excited for you because you're about to go to medical school and it's people like you who are curious and interested and always learning for the next best thing that are going to help our medical system improve because we all know that our medical care could improve around chronic pain, right? So before we start and launch into my subject matter this morning, I want to do a little experience experiment with you. So this lovely breakfast, it's really delicious and thank you for the catering staff. It's it's a great breakfast to serve, um, but I'd like if you're eating to, to have you put the food down for just a minute, because I'm going to need your brain's full attention for this. <laughs> All right, so I have some visual inspiration here, lemons, and I want you to imagine that I'm holding a lemon, and it's a beautifully shaped, perfect lemon. Amazing, it's non-GMO and totally organic and still perfect. And I have a knife down here. And I'm going to start scoring the rind of this lemon. And you can probably start to smell the fragrance. You can probably see some of the spray in your mind. And I can feel the weight of that lemon change. And I'm going to open it up, give it a couple squeezes so the juice comes out running down my hand. And I'm going to slurp some of that juice. And I'm curious. Whose mouth watered a little bit? Raise your hands up. Almost the whole room. So isn't it amazing how our nervous system can take some information based on knowledge we have about what a lemon shape is like and what a knife might do to it, and that activates a physiological response. And when it comes to sensory experiences like taste or thirst or touch, pleasant touch, we are very accepting of how powerful our brain can be and how an input that may be fully imaginary 
right? Or visually generated, calling on areas of our brain that have encoded information throughout our lives. Our brains can take that data and turn it into an output that is physiologically manifested. And what I find curious is why we don't do this with pain. And I think we should. I think our patients would be better off if we did. So I'm going to talk about the neuroscience of pain and give you a um, little bit more of an understanding why it matters to discuss the nervous system, to teach people about the brain and the spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system and how all of that works to generate a pain experience. And hopefully by the end of the morning, you'll feel confident that you can start to use some of the, the words that I'm using today and teach your patients about pain in a different way than you were probably formally trained to do in school. Or I might even guess that most of us weren't formally trained how to do this. And that, that also needs to change. So a few disclosures, I am a federal employee, but I'm not here acting as one today. So everything I say is based on my own research and the science that I read and the clinical experience I have as a physical therapist specializing in chronic pain. Um, but it, what I say does in no way represent the official position of the Department of Veterans Affairs. I also am a member, a coalition member of uh, a, a task force that was put together through the North American Spine Foundation now called Just the Spine Foundation because this group has expanded to international um, members and so it wouldn't be representative to call it just the North American group. But our, our goal is to hopefully uh, create a 10% reduction in spine related disability by the, age, uh, by the year 2025. And this is a fully volunteer group. So it's a pretty amazing um, organization and a, and a huge mission that we hope to achieve. So keep your eyes out for changes there. So my background, I share my background with you all because uh, I did not strive to go into chronic pain management when I got out of school. I'm not sure if, if anyone here did, but this was not my goal. Um, I was a sports medicine oriented, athletic training oriented kind of therapist. And because of the nature of, of our medical system, healthcare system and education system, I have huge debt, so I had to work extra, which means that I worked as a registry therapist, so all of these other settings, um, the geriatrics, long-term rehab, acute neuro rehab, uh, workers' compensation, that was all done outside of my work as an orthopedic uh, sports medicine therapist. But that gave me a chance to see along the care continuum how people were treated and how people talk about pain and, and what we do about it. And when I chose to take the job I have now, it was interesting to me because of the program development opportunity, um, because of the, the chance that I had to work with people without thinking in terms of absolute dollar amounts for every minute spent. That was a luxury. And that's a big reason why I chose to go the direction I did and took an opportunity with the Veterans uh, Affairs, the Medical Center in San Francisco. But that meant that I had to convert over to 100% chronic pain care. And that was scary for me, really. I didn't, I didn't know that I would be uh, helping people based on my skill set. And I didn't share this with many people at the time. I just pretended it was going to be all fine, right? But it was scary. I had a lot of anxiety about it because I had the stigma that we all have that chronic pain can't change, that we just have to teach people how to learn to live with it, and that, you know, these are just the hardest patients to work with. While some of that is true, this is a challenging population, I have seen time and time again people change the way they think about pain, change the way they regard their bodies, find more confidence in their bodies and less fear in what they do with their bodies based on shifting how we frame pain, how we talk about it, and really how we understand it. So a couple more disclosures. I might challenge your understanding of pain today. I had to challenge my own beliefs about what I understood in terms of physiology, neuroanatomy, neurophysiology. I was formally taught all of that in my training and, and um, getting my doctorate degree, but that didn't mean that I really understood the nuances or appreciated the, the really the whole person approach and really not. I'm losing my train of thought because I was baffled by how much I had to shift my thinking when I went into 100% chronic pain care. Um, but I encourage you to challenge my understanding of the material I'm going to present today. Um, 
that's how we all learn. Everybody throughout our adult life, as adult learners, we've got to be open to challenging our own beliefs, but that also comes with some internal contention and uh, you know, not feeling comfortable with these ideas. So please throw your ideas out and we're gonna talk about it. Uh, and I might change what I say today if I give a talk like this five years from now because evidence always changes and it's our responsibility, especially if we believe in evidence-based practice, to be open to shifting completely what we say and what we do based on the science. And I encourage you to change your current and future views on pain based on evidence that may be emerging. So I spend a lot of time helping patients understand that the nervous system is king. The nervous system is in charge of everything. But you'd be surprised how many people have never heard that term, nervous system. What does that mean? You mean the nerve that's pinched in my back, they'll say? No, the nervous system. So I'm gonna help you understand why using that language, nervous system and brain, when you discuss pain is important. And doing it in a validating way and helping people understand that just because our brain produces sensory experiences doesn't mean that's all in our head. That's a big leap to make for some people. I'm gonna review some current research that highlights the benefits, the measurable benefits of teaching people about pain from a neuroscience perspective and then help you feel confident that you too can speak about pain uh, from a nervous system standpoint and teach you some simple tools and simple phrases that you can start incorporating into your daily practice. So you all know, I'm sure I don't have to tell you, you work in public health, <laughs> you know that things are changing rapidly. Um, and in my short career, I've been practicing 11 years now and I've seen a lot of shifts. Uh, the conferences I go to, especially the pain-focused conferences, just about every year, the pendulum is swinging back and forth and where people, people's perspectives lie. And our healthcare system in general is changing because now I think we are starting to recognize pain as an epidemic. And this is really key. And I think in public health, this is what's going to get us advancement in social policy and medical policy and reimbursement changes. I mean, that happened for diabetes and we see the measurable benefits of the way we changed our practice. So if we considered pain that way and treated it that way on a societal level, I think we would have a lot more success than we do. Now I'm not going to go into details on how persistent pain costs our society a lot in terms of money and resources in other ways. Um, I think you know those statistics and I also know that Karen's going to speak about them a little later. But what's interesting is that despite all the advances we have in our medical care and the technologies that we can now use and do wonderful things to you know, help our bodies um, recover surgical interventions, fantastic things, and yet we haven't solved the pain problem. In fact, it seems to be getting worse. So the number of people suffering from chronic pain now is much higher than it was just a few years ago. And what I teach patients is that persistent pain is actually a problem. Because of all the adaptations of, that our nervous system undergoes, the longer that pain persists, those create a new problem, and that is what we're treating. So a lot of people that come to see me and my colleagues are there to hope that, that this person finally is gonna find the cause of my pain and fix it. And I'm sure you come across this too. But educating patients that pain is the problem, that it is the target for treatment, because of how the nervous system has changed, that opens new doors. So we're at a crossroads recently, thanks to the CDC guidelines that were released in March. This is causing some upset where I work quite a bit because the CDC is federal and, you know, big federal policy means that I can't have what I need as a patient. That's what we hear a lot. Um, but what I think is going on is that patients who, are, who have been reliant on chronic opioid therapy for non-cancer pain conditions for decades weren't taught enough other tools, didn't know that there were other tools, or didn't recognize that those tools would be just as, if not more effective than these powerful medications. And so they're riding along on a train that even if they're not sure where they're going anymore, even if it doesn't seem like it's a good ride, might be bumpy and trains falling apart, but at least they're on the train. And now what seems to be happening is somebody's pulled the emergency brake and kicked all the passengers off and now they're wandering around not knowing where to go. And that's much worse than being on a train that's going nowhere. 
And we know that humans can adapt, and, and I think things will change, but education, for me, is, is a huge um, tool to get us there. So biopsychosocial framework, who knows this term? Show of hands. At least half the room, that's good. Since 1977, Dr. Engel has been calling for this framework to be used in medical care so that we appreciate everything in each of these three spheres, that medicine should not only be about the biological aspects, that we have to consider psychological and social aspects and how these all interact with each other. And when it comes to persistent pain, the biopsychosocial model for persistent or chronic pain really is the personal construct of how the biological elements so pain and nociception interact with cultural, linguistic, family, workplace, um, and, and all the psychological aspects, their beliefs about nociception and pain. Now, I use that word nociception. Most of my patients, by the time they're done working with me, know that word. <laughs> um, but it's, it's how, what's the vehicle that we might use to describe this? I think a lot of medical practitioners, whether it be um, primary care, allied health, specialty clinicians, I think we still, you know, biological realms are where we're comfortable. And so we might say, yeah, there's a biological problem, but it affects the psychological aspects. And the longer the biological problem is there, it might, it might affect the social aspects, but it's still sort of founded in this biological part. And this model, Loser's model here on the left, is a pretty fairly well-known model describing this relationship that I just mentioned, where nociception is at the core. And once those nociceptors are activated, you get pain and then suffering and then pain behaviors to try to deal with that, right? Now that's an old model, 1983, that's still used all the time. Three years ago, at a national pain conference, I had the pleasure of hearing Dr. Daniel Carr speak, and his keynote address was titled Beyond the Bricks. And he is someone who's very deeply interested in social policy change, and he was one of the first people I heard say that if we considered chronic pain to be a social epidemic like other health conditions, we would get further along. But this is what I love. He said, yeah, yeah, biopsychosocial, everyone throws that term around now, but I think we all still practice 80% biofocused. And I'm going to say with the neuroscience of pain, the material I'm going to show you today, that is biological. But I think we need to make the leap to really recognize that psychological inputs and thoughts and memories have biological effects. And I'm not sure that we fully appreciate that internally, and, and we certainly don't talk about it in those ways. So the Explain Pain book, the authors of this book, uh, Drs. Lorimer, Mosley, and David Butler, um, this is a great resource for you to learn about the neuroscience of pain, or the neurophysiology of pain is more accurate. But I like the onion skin model that they put forth. It's based on the Lusser model that we had earlier, but here, nociception is still at the core of the onion, but pain really is what drives all of these things to change, and in turn, all of these things come back and change pain. I'm going to help you understand a little bit more about that and how to explain this to patients later. So patients really want to know these things. When they come into our office, people in pain want to know what is wrong with me. Their body is telling them something is wrong, right? And when I ask people, what is the purpose of pain? I'm asking patients this every day. 80 to 90% of them will say, well, it's because you have something wrong inside your body and you've got to fix it. They want to know how long will it take, and I would think all of us would want to know these things if we had a sudden onset of a, a nasty pain experience. What we don't often think about, but really need to, is people do want to know, what can I do to care for myself? Now granted, the people that we work with, if you're working in chronic pain care, like I do, the people I see have been through the medical system for years, so many of them don't have any more awareness that there are still things they can do for themselves. But the self-care is really where we need to bolster our efforts. I put a reference here, listed number two, of a great study that really shows clearly that self-efficacy is the component that matters most in predicting long-term outcomes for persistent pain. That if people don't have the internal resources to effect change in their own lives, outcomes don't change very much. 
in the long term. Now, we can probably have lots of conversations about how various non-pharmaceutical interventions can help in the short term, but how does that change the long term if someone gets reliant on passive strategies? We need to think about how can we teach our patients what they can do for themselves. And this empowerment, I have observed, comes from people deeply understanding pain states from a different perspective. And that's what I spent a lot of time doing. So what can, it's, it's clear they come to a health professional knowing, wanting to know what we can do for them. And there is lots of room for that. But that's only one element, okay? So I'm going to spend just a bit of time talking about how medicine explains pain still quite deeply entrenched in the biomedical model. And in my field, the biomechanical model or the structural postural model, right? That's, that's still where we're oriented and where a lot of formal education programs are focused. And this biomedical or biomechanical model is deeply rooted in the Cartesian model of pain, which was revolutionary back in the late 1600s. And surprisingly, we still use this. We still consider pain as some some response to a stimulus, a direct stimulus response relationship, very dualistic. Even though we've got plenty of evidence that says otherwise, this is our go-to. And a lot of medical interventions or treatment approaches are aimed at blocking the pain message or the pain signal. And I think we need to speak differently about this. So being among the bricks, as Dr. Carr would have said, is being very tissue focused at the periphery, the minutia that we can try to do something to at the spots we can reach without surgery. At least that's our job. Any surgeons in the room? No, okay. And I, I failed to ask this at the beginning, but I'm curious to know who is, who's among us here. How many of you are primary care physicians? Okay, a little more than half. And how about nurses? Good. Uh, pharmacists? Oh, Mike, you're a pharmacist. Hello. <laughs> uh, I love pharmacists. I work really closely with pharmacists and psychologists. Um, how about specialists? And are you interventional medicine or surgery or what kind of? Eh? Don't want to share? Okay. <laughs> specialists, yeah? Thank you. Physician assistants. Excellent. Advanced practice nurses, would that be in the category? Still the same people, good. Um, social workers, licensed social work, good. Also in the mental health realm, mostly, right? In this context, okay. So, arguably we're still all, even physical therapists, the, you know, my scope of practice doesn't include interventions um, or medications, but our training in my field is still very tissue focused, you know? So, I was taught about the healing times for various tissues. For good reason, we need to care about this, but, but when it comes to pain, if we're thinking pain is a sign that tissue hasn't healed, then we go look for that tissue root around somewhere and make sure we get it to heal again. And this is what patients come to me understanding, and it's, it's actually false, right? We know that persistent pain states are states in our nervous system that occur when tissue healing has taken place to the best of its ability. And what you may not be able to see very clearly because of the color of the font down below is that back to the Loser model here, nociception equals pain in a biomedical approach. So if we stimulate nociceptors, then we must have pain. And these are, remember, high threshold neurons, meaning that in our society, the problem with this concept is that we assume there's a one-to-one -one relationship between how active those nociceptors are and how much pain someone feels, which is a problem when someone comes to us whose x-ray looks fine, MRI is clean, never had an injury, a fall, a blunt force trauma, never had a blast injury, never, none of that. So you think there's no nociception, how can you have real pain? I'm not saying you all think that, I'm just saying this is what comes, comes across. And I want to ask this question, is nociception actually required for pain production? Great, I see some heads shaking. Yes, patients don't know this. Once they learn what nociception is, they still are not sure about this in my experience. So I'm going to tell a story where I had an aha moment in my clinical work. And this was years after I had already been working 100% in chronic pain. 
I was fully bought into this neuroscience stuff. Didn't take much convincing, because like I said, I was anxious going into this line of work, and I thought, there's nothing I can do to help people. And then I started c communicating and networking with people and on social media and professionals like myself who were also perplexed and frustrated by our trainings falling short with the people who didn't get better. So this is a couple years after I had really delved into this different direction for following research and thinking about pain in the body. And I had an injury on the job. I had the luxury of going through the workers' comp care system. Sorry if you work in that realm. I, so yeah, there's a lot of fixing we could do there. Uh, and this injury happened under a particularly stressful context where I was working overtime, I had a student with me, I was in the ICU. I did a rather benign maneuver, crouching down, reaching, you know, anyone work in the ICU? Mm, no? You? Yeah, yeah. Aaron's nurse. So they make it purposefully very difficult to pull plugs out of the wall, right? <laughs> so I had to yank with my left arm at a strange position. And I felt and heard something, and then I had a whoosh of sort of warmth. And I thought, that didn't seem right. And, but my student's here, and uh, you know we have more patients to see today. And so I went on about my day. In the middle of the night, I wake up, and that shoulder is aching and throbbing and shooting pain. And I thought, ooh, something its not right. But what could I possibly have done? And my PT brain is going through all the scenarios on what I could have injured, and it wasn't a big mechanism of injury, not a large force, not a big, you know, angle variation that would have caused a major structural impairment. And so then I go through the motions and see my doctor, and this work comp doc was fabulous. He did all the right things. He, he inquired about my activities in my youth and my adolescence and my young adulthood and, and prepping me to say, we don't need to get an x-ray or an MRI right now because it's probably not going to show much. You're in your mid-30s. And, you know, and I'm thinking, right, but this is work comp, and if I don't prove that I have something wrong, then I'm going to have to you know, go through all these things in my head. And then my, my professional brain says, stop that. That's not going to help. You know very well MRIs aren't going to show anything useful at this stage. Let's give it some. So I'm going through all these things. I know too much for my own good. And it's a very stressful time. So longer story, medium length, is that it took several months to get an MRI that didn't tell me a whole lot, as expected. Uh, and then a year and a half later, it took that long to stop hurting. And I'm finally back to sleeping on that side, and I'm feeling good, and I almost forget about it. And then I'm in a rehab class, pain rehab, intensive rehab program, with about six people who are struggling with persistent pain and wanting to learn more. And we get on a conversation about medical imaging and, and what's that like in a conversation with doctors that we, we might face. And so I decide it's an appropriate time to self-disclose, and I tell my patients all about that experience with my shoulder. And I went through all the steps, and it was the first time in probably a year that I had demonstrated physically what I was doing. And remember, it had been four months. You see what's coming? My shoulder immediately throbbing, aching, shooting pains. And I stopped what I was doing, and I said to my class, this is so cool. It hurts so much, but it's really cool, and let me tell you why. And so now they think I'm a little Looney Tunes, but this is how our nervous system works. I did not do anything in my physical gestures that would have caused any nociceptor activity, but my brain regions cued right into all of those motor memories, if you will, recall, and neural networks that got activated, neural tags that were formulated when I was going through that very stressful experience. And that pain that surged up immediately while I was speaking lasted another two weeks. It was very stiff, shoulder achy. I couldn't raise it overhead again. And each and every time I tell that story to someone, a single patient or a group, I get a, a little surge of pain, but every time it gets a little bit less. And that's an important lesson in why I know pain can change. Because if we repeatedly and gently expose our nervous system to these kinds of things, and reinforce the idea that that doesn't mean anything dangerous is going on, pain can change. That big nervous system response can get small. So the biopsychosocial model hopefully focuses on the disease. Yes, we need to make sure we're not just assuming all chronic pain means nothing new is going on with your patients. And I educate patients to recognize that too. I, in fact, had a patient one time who, uh, now he's a he's hell's angel. He's like a tough dude, right? Tattoos all over, doesn't go to the doctor unless he absolutely has to. And he, at one point, decided that the pain down his arm was just no big deal, and he's going to 
work through it until one day he couldn't grab hold of his motorcycle <laughs> anymore. And so ignoring pain is something that's also dangerous, right? And I don't want our patients to ignore pain. Um, but we need to make sure that we're recognizing the precursors to that pain. And like my, my injury or my experience of pain, what led up to that time a year and a half after the fact, what led up to my brain saying, ooh, we need to protect you right now? We need to make sure we teach people about the strong connection between the brain and the body. And I dispel myths when I teach patients. I dispel the myth that there's a single pain center in the brain. There isn't. We know this, but patients don't know this. I've been asked before, can't you just do a lobotomy? <laughs> Take this pain away? It doesn't work like that. And thank goodness, right? I'm glad that I can smell a certain kind of chapstick and relive the times in ninth grade when I had a crush on a boy, you know. That stuff, it all gets carried with us, thankfully. And unfortunately, that's true with pain. So including neuro, uh, pain neurophysiology education into a pain care plan, I believe is something we should all consider. And it's easier than it sounds, um, but I will say there are some caveats that we'll get to. Interdisciplinary and rehab therapies, now I imagine that a number of you in the room, by the way, are there any other rehab specialists? I forgot to ask about my own profession, no? Um, uh, it, where I work, there's a lot of this going on after March. There's a huge influx of PT referrals, right? Well, if we can't have that, let's do this. And my guess is that you try to refer people to rehab therapies and many of them say, no, or I've done that and it didn't help. So this actually, this kind of uh, reframing, how we understand pain is helpful to clinicians, gives us hope that things can change, revives you know, the way we've been practicing, and we don't have to throw out everything we've learned. You don't, if you're a manual therapist, you don't have to just abandon that, but talk about it differently, and you can get better results. So instead of the Lurser model or the Cartesian model of pain, this is the one that I like and that I use, and I'll teach you later on how I use it to teach patients about pain. This comes from a physical therapist, Louis Gifford, who is unfortunately dead far earlier than, than he should have been. He died young. But he was probably 20 years ahead of his time in terms of um, how he understood the body. The mature organism model is still a model, but I think better represents what actually happens on a physiological and brain level. And so if you see the, the two spheres there, granted there's no physical body, but that's not to suggest that the body doesn't matter. It does. I'm not, I'm not a pain is only in the brain person. The body does matter. There's plenty of data or information coming from the tissues of our body 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're also collecting information through the senses that we gather external data from. Um, so what we see and taste and hear and smell. And our brain gets all of that has to scrutinize it, and in a split second, make some decision on what to do with it. And I'm looking, if you can see from the back, I don't know if you can, but the brain samples itself, this is really key, that the scrutinizing does not ever just involve the information from the sensory networks or the internal regulatory systems, but the brain samples itself. And our brain's collecting information all throughout our lives, which is why back pain is not a simple thing to solve with two individuals having the same mechanism of injury, you're not gonna have the same pain experience with those. And you won't have the same success with similar approach because their brains have had different lives and their brains evaluate threat and danger differently. So as long as I've been understanding pain differently, I've run up against this notion that a lot of people in the healthcare system are trying to pound a square peg into a round hole. We're trying to make a model fit where it clearly doesn't. The biomedical model has outlived its usefulness, in my opinion. It's not explanatory enough. It doesn't encompass enough about how our bodies work. So explaining pain, thankfully there are uh, research studies that show when you describe the nervous system and talk about nociceptive pathways and talk about sensitization and teach people how the amount of pain you have may not represent the amount of body damage you have, things change. So there's a systematic review in there that highlights how you can measurably change fear avoidance behavior, measurably change Oswestry scale, measurably change a straight leg raise, you can measurably change uh, people's active engagement in other healthcare options. And in some cases, you can change pain. 
And I've seen that too. I'm going to present one study that's pretty interesting that will matter a lot to you folks, I think, that changing healthcare costs, you know, it's always the bottom dollar that matters if we want to change healthcare policy. And to say education as therapy is great, but how do we get it paid for? Right? I was taught certain, um, certain CPT codes that I could submit for reimbursement in the services that I provide, and I was never trained about the 9800 series, and probably doesn't reimburse enough, that's education, individual and groups, probably doesn't reimburse enough to keep the office doors open, right? But I think this needs to change, because education is powerful if it's done right. So anybody have an example where you know you had tissue damage, but you didn't have pain? Anyone? Anyone over there? You want to share? Yeah, um, a long-term injury where the bone was fractured and came through the leg. There was no pain in the side. Uh-huh. Pain elsewhere. Pain elsewhere. So the comment was there's a long-term injury where the bone was fractured, so compound fracture came through the leg, and there was no pain at the site. Right. So that actually maps on well to Kevin Ware's experience. Everyone know this basketball player, young man? I didn't either. I'm not a big you know, sports fan, but I had to look it up. But Kevin Ware, this is three years ago now, and you can find, if you type his name, W-A-R-E, into uh, YouTube, you're going to find all sorts of gruesome videos from people courtside. This is a, a young college athlete who had, in a high-stakes game, suffered a double compound fracture. Tibia and fibula went straight through the skin. It looks pretty gnarly, right? Legs should not look like that. And yet, he was interviewed over and over after the fact. Didn't it hurt? What was that like? And he said, you know, it was the strangest thing. I just didn't feel pain. Right? And how about this? Anyone have an experience where they know they didn't have any tissue damage, but they definitely felt pain? I gave you one. Right? No active tissue damage at the time my pain resurged. So there's a pretty interesting case study that uh, demonstrates this. This is back from 1995, actually, in Great Britain. This is a 29-year-old builder who had jumped off of a surface at the work site, and a 15-centimeter, about 6-inch nail went straight through the work boot. And so he gets brought into the emergency department, and uh, he's writhing in agony, and the staff just can't get him pinned down to get the nail out and assess the wound. So they sedate the man with Versed and fentanyl, and he's nice and quiet and placid, and then they take the nail out and they remove the boot. And if you read the study, it's fascinating. There's this triage nurse in the ER trauma center. He says, a miraculous cure had taken place. <laughs> because when we figured the nail penetrated proximal to the steel toe cap, but it actually went right between two toes. <laughs> and that man's brain did its job, right? Assessed potential risk and danger and activated all of the systems that motivated this guy to get some help. But that's not fake pain or imagined pain. That's not psychosomatic pain or whatever that term means. Patients, it's still a stigmatized term too. This is real pain. This is the real physiological effect of a brain's evaluation of danger or threat. So we know that nociception is not necessary for pain production. And it's sometimes not even sufficient for pain production. Kevin Ware had plenty of nociception going on. And what's your name? Alex. Alex, also, in her experience. That same biker dude who ignored a radiculopathy that needed medical attention, he uh, told me another story about how he got a foot crush injury. I don't remember exactly how, but he was very well aware that his foot was just pancaked, and it didn't hurt. And he thought that was curious. So challenging our tissue issue beliefs is not Im only important for our patients, it's important for us. So I'm going to ask you, which one hurts more? A baby bite, a puppy bite, or a shark bite? Granted, all various levels of tissue damage, can we predict which is going to have more pain? We cannot. Some people are deathly afraid of puppies. I'm a cat person myself. I love dogs, but I own cats, and I've had plenty of scrapes and cuts. And I don't really notice them most of the time until I spill lemon juice in them. But we know that tissue damage doesn't match pain much of the time. And this is the most important thing that I think we can start getting across to our patients, that your pain is real and it doesn't mean it's a sign of ongoing damage. So biomedical explanations are still very oriented towards our body breaks down and that causes pain. Wear and tear. 
bulging disc, herniated disc, DJD, osteophytes, all these things that show up on MRI reports or x-ray reports, which by the way are being mailed out, uh, at least where I work, mailed to patients without any conversation about it. And I think that's got to change. It's really got to change. And yet we also know that imaging reports don't match people's subjective experiences. Arthritis and pain are not predictive of each other, right? So this Finnan study, his group looked at a large number of people with osteoarthritis of the knees, and independent examiners would look at the x-ray reports and then try to match on who had pain. And the people with the worst x-rays were not always the people with the worst pain. And I think everybody's nodding, they know this. And as a young therapist, that was my experience too. I didn't know what to make of it. My first job in a sports medicine clinic was in a busy, um, network of hospitals and outpatient clinics where we had a, a, a orthopedic surgical group as a high referral source. So these guys, these docs were doing, um, and they were all male doctors, I think, um, were doing bilateral knee replacements a lot. You know, they would either do it in short succession, three or four weeks, one after the other, or both in the same time. And the patients that I would see would be a little puzzled. We were actually had a prehab program, so people would come before surgery to make sure they're as strong as possible. So these folks before surgery would tell me, more often than, than I can count, would say, yeah, well, both my knees got to have this replacement thing, but the doc looked at the x-rays and said, my right knee needs to go first, because that's the worst one. It's bone on bone. But you know what? My left one hurts more. And I thought, okay. Surgeons know better than I do, and I'm not saying they don't in that, in that realm, but I think it's interesting that we definitely are oriented towards pictures and hoping they'll tell us the story. So if it were just a peripheral process, you would think that painful arthritic knees would only hurt at the knee. And we heard a story earlier where it hurt elsewhere, not at the site, so central processing changes in persistent pain states, and this has been measured quite nicely, elegantly in the King study, 2013, where they're able to show that deep pressure sensitivity changes at remote sites for people who have high-grade osteoarthritic changes and a lot of symptoms associated. That they don't just hurt at the knee, but they're more sensitive everywhere else. That's a central processing change, evidence of that. So I think it, we need to change the narrative Change the narrative, how we talk about this, okay? I'm an advocate to get rid of these terms. Why do we keep saying there is such a thing as pain nerves? C fibers, A delta fibers, yes, they transmit nociceptive input, but are they transmitting a pain message? They don't. Pain occurs after the message has been received and processed. Granted, it's a split second kind of thing. But to continue perpetuating this language, I think really does do harm for patients who think that this pain nerve can be cut out and stop signaling the pain message, or we can block the pain message, or we can find the pain center in the brain and put a stimulator in it or something, right? This kind of language it may seem harmless, but it actually reinforces an idea and a belief that isn't helpful in the patients who really suffer with persistent pain that's debilitating. So it doesn't work like a telephone line that we could just stop the message, interrupt it, and then we don't experience pain. Okay, how do you explain phantom limb pain if this were the model we're using? So back to Gifford's mature organism model. It's an output, input, output system, or input, output, input, however you like to frame it. It's not like a telephone, it's more like a thermostat. If you're gonna use a gadget that we all know, talk about a thermostat where it's an internal regulatory system that feeds off of information from the exterior environment, does something centrally, and then produces a change. So we adjust the temperature all the time in rooms, and once the ambient air has changed in temperature enough, the mechanism changes its behavior, right? Changing the narrative also means we have to educate patients about how normal arthritic changes or um, bone changes might be all over our body. So for those in the back, this is a summary of uh, a study that was re released in 2014. This is a systematic review, over 3,400 subjects in total, and specifically looking at asymptomatic subjects in age groups from 20 to 80, up to 90. 
And I'm going to come around here. No. Sorry. So I can actually read some of these that are circled. In this particular study, 37% of 20-year-olds have disc degeneration, asymptomatic, and they're in their 20s. Right? We might all accept that by the time we're 60, we'll have something, but we don't think about 20-year-olds. And especially where I work, where the very active 20-year-olds and weightlifting most of their young adult life, that's going to necessarily change things in their spine. But it doesn't necessarily cause pain. 80% of 50-year-olds had disc degeneration, which makes sense, right? We're around the planet long enough. And 96%, by the time we all reach 80, are we all going to reach 80 years old? Right? By the time we reach 80 years old, we're all going to have something. And on, on the contrast here is disc bulging. Now, that's something that's very nefarious. That's a bad word to patients. So that means dangerous stuff is happening in my spine. So this disc bulge, if, if I could, I would also change the use of that term. Because it's very common. It doesn't have to be something that's fear-provoking. 30% of these 20-year-olds who were studied with no symptoms at all, 30% had a disc bulge. 60% of 50-year-olds had one. 84% of 80-year-olds had them. So I teach patients that a lot of changes that we might find on x-ray or MRI are just normal. That's what our body does. Doesn't mean it has to hurt. And the same people who might have an acute disc bulge and have it recede after 9 months or 12 months are still going to show some changes in their scans. But when their pain goes away, their scans won't change. Right? So I teach people about a very common principle that was drilled into my head as a physical therapy student, the SED principle, specific adaptation to impose demand. This is something we all understand. When I was seven years old, I used to look forward to developing my summer feet. Right? Get my shoes off, forget that for three months. The first two weeks were a little uncomfortable because my feet were adapting and I grew calluses. And I, the summer feet was just a thing that I made up, but this is the concept, the principle in action. And why do we think that that happens in our skin of the hands and our elbows and our feet, but not in our spines? Of course it does. Patients don't know this, but they need to know this. So if we, if we impose a load demand gradually enough, our tissues all over the body will adapt. And so someone like this who's missing a leg and has a prosthetic limb can end up squatting 400 plus pounds, right? And not be harmed by it, because you increase the load gradually enough, things adapt. And I love this, those same authors, Mosley and Butler, who authored the Explain Pain book in 2003, released a sequel to it, more interactive book for patients called the Protectometer, or Protectometer, because they're Australian. This quote says, our skin shows signs of age with wrinkles and spots. Our spine shows signs of age in other ways. Osteophytes and degenerative changes are like wrinkles on the inside. So if I'm going to talk about our bodies operating like something else we know, it's not a car. It's more like a tree where adaptiveness is a strength. So trees can learn to grow around all sorts of obstacles, change their shape, but still function just fine and be healthy. It's really important that we teach people about the other modulators of pain that are very powerful, like meaning. What does it mean if I hurt my back? Yeah, you're finally seeing the cartoon, right? <laughs> what does it mean if I hurt my back? What does it mean if I can't do my job? What does it mean to my family? What does it mean to my longevity, my future? We know that uh, the threshold for nociceptive activation, or I'm just now putting my foot in my mouth, the threshold for pain production in a professional violinist is lower on the left pinky finger than it is for the right pinky finger because of meaning. What does it mean to have some threat to the left hand? It means more risk to their future and profession. If you lose your pinky finger on the right side, you can still use that bow pretty well, I think. I'm not a professional violinist. Context matters a lot. Now, when I was going through school, uh, I was bothered by the Waddell signs. You know, and, and this, again, is I'm not knocking the work comp system. I just think that these misconceptions about pain have led professionals to doubt patients because of behavior that we observe. 
So if somebody walks comfortably through a parking lot and limps into your office lobby, we just naturally assume that that must mean they're faking it. And I hope nobody here does that, but I know people have in our history. And context, in fact, we forget how we are constructing a context in, in how we arrange our office, what kind of lighting we have, how we approach somebody. Brains are programmed to survey environments. Biologically, we're just naturally looking for signs of danger. And when your nervous system has been in a persistent pain state for a long time, those danger signals can get much, much more prevalent. The hypervigilance in the population I treat, a large number have PTSD, and they get that. If you treat someone who's had trauma and they know it and they have insight about it, that relationship between pain and PTSD or pain and a, and a trauma brain actually is pretty clear to people. And for some reason we're not stigmatizing PTSD, but we do stigmatize pain, right? Expectations and experience. I think we all know some research about expectations, that if people expect things to hurt, it really will hurt more. And what I teach patients here is that you can't just think your way out of pain. Knowing this doesn't automatically change it, but it's a start. So I tend to bring it back down to other sensory experiences and demonstrate how our brain is calculating an output based on a lot of different things. Our brain does not ever produce a taste experience based on just data from the tongue. This is an elegant study too, I thought. It was fascinating. In 2004, not in the pain research realm, but in the social sciences realm, this was a 2004 study uh, looking at people's experiences of crispness of potato chips. And the subjects were actually placed in a soundproof booth and given headphones that would then re-engineer the noises that were created when they bit into this chip. And so they were asked to rate the relative freshness of the chips and how pleasant it was to eat them. And even though it's the same batch of chips for every person, they rated those very differently based on the sounds that were manipulated. And that's how great our brain is. But if we don't appreciate that when it comes to pain, we can really get stuck in ruts. So I use a slide like this with patients to educate them and then let them know, and I'll let you know, that our brain doesn't produce a pain experience based only on nociceptors, okay? So a 2000 st 2007 study, this was Mosley again and his colleague Arndt, um, 2007, they took a group of people and placed a very cold metal rod to the back of the hand. And without being told, the people were simultaneously presented either with a red light or a blue light, one or the other, and they were asked to rate how much pain they had. And this was done more than once. Invariably, except for one patient in that study, invariably the pain was rated and experienced as higher when the red cue was present. And here we are back to meaning. What does our society teach us about the color red? Stop signs are red. Sirens are red. Fire. All these warnings, signals are red. That has a higher threat value than does blue. So it makes sense that these brains would have calculated and factored that in. So think again about your back pain patients or people with pain in their backs. Their brains have collected a lot of different cues over their lives that may factor into their pain experience. They may have had this injury or the onset of pain on the job, and they may have remembered that they were doing a lifting and twisting thing. Now granted, there is a higher rate of injury with those types of maneuvers, but what if the person was lifting and twisting with an empty file box? When I did my thing, I was just pulling a plug out of the wall. Right? I'm not saying there was a high amount of tissue damage, but there was quite a bit of swelling and there was a strain inflammatory process, and that happens a lot in backs too. And by the way, people need to know that we can sprain our backs just as often as we sprain our ankles, and it, can be regarded about the same in most cases. But we have these cues all throughout our society about how dangerous it might be to do a very simple task. And our brains collect that information. And then we have things like this floating around the internet, which give very scary pictures about what's, what might be happening in the spine. And by the way, these pictures do not accurately represent what's going on on the inside. They don't show the very thick protective layers of ligaments that cover the spine. And they don't tell us how rich in sensory nerves those ligaments are, so they're gonna notice any change in the environment. But what people see in this picture is a jelly donut that can easily splooge out of the spine and make a mess of the nerves around there. Now I had a patient two months ago who told me after four levels of fusion in her spine over the course of seven years, 
she said, every time I bend over, I just pop another disc. So I can't bend anymore. It's a tragic case, and I did what I could to help educate her, but it was too, some people, their belief is just too far down and gets reinforced by too many instances of another surge in pain with the activity. It's, um, it's very sad to me. There are other things that might factor into these brains concluding that the meaning of this pain is bad. Maybe they've had a bad experience with surgery or maybe they have a loved one with a bad experience for surgery. So they think if my pain is so bad I need surgery, I don't want to go there. Or they might not feel safe on the job. And there is pretty robust data that shows the predictive factors that tell us who's going to get chronic pain in a workplace injury situation. It's not to do with the lifting and twisting mechanism or the repetitive loads. Those people get higher rates of injury, but those are not the people who necessarily develop chronic pain. The predictive factor that matters most is workplace relationships. How safe do you feel there? So Adrian Lau is a pain educator. He's um, got a number of different resources available to teach clinicians and patients about pain and a number of courses online and in person if you're curious. I think they, this group does a nice job. But I like this quote. Patients want you to explain their pain. And what do we do? We grab an anatomy book or a spine model and we say, this is why. And I'm arguing we should stop doing most of that. I do have spine models in my office, but I, in fact, you know how all these spine models now, you can't get one without a splooging disc? Like it's got a little donut coming out? I've actually taken a razor blade and cut that off. Yes, and I'm not the only one. There was, in fact, a movement, one of the, an international conference where p clinicians who were in attendance, I wasn't there, but I heard about this, were asked to do the same thing and then mail all those little bulging discs in and some presenter at the conference made a necklace out of them. <laughs> They're not useful. All they do is, is serve this false belief that our spines are vulnerable and that they need protecting much more often than they do. And I, I will say, it's not that I'm cavalier about pain, I take it seriously, but I think when it comes to the spine especially, we're far too um, catastrophizing in, in the medical system. We reinforce these beliefs. And we know that if somebody doesn't believe that something good is possible, they're going to have poor outcomes and higher pain sensitivity. And when it comes to my role in this as a physical therapist, I think it's a setup. I was trained to look at posture and to look at symmetry and to assess relative positions of bony landmarks. I'm, look, I'm making this face now because that made a lot of sense when I went through the training. But the research just does not support that clearly enough to make those claims. And yet, this is how we might do a physical exam. Well, sir, you have back pain because you clearly have a rotated anonymous, and we're going to just put it right back into place and pelvic torsion or your leg length discrepancy that, by the way, you probably had your whole life, but now you have pain. It suddenly started when you were 32 for some reason. Uh, or and any number of things that you can see here, impinged shoulder joint, tight hamstrings, right? Well, what if this is what people are hearing? I had a patient this week who has fibromyalgia, um, erosive RA, she's got thyroid issues, she's got a lot of health issues. And her pain had been treated before she came to me by a colleague of mine who's now retired. She's a wonderful therapist and, and I know her and trust her and, and I went for her personally for help. Um, but this woman I saw said, you know, this other therapist had taught me how to put my pelvis back in, and, but I tried it and I couldn't do it myself. I needed her. And can you do that for me? And I'm thinking, this poor woman now really has this belief that her pelvis is slipping out they don't do that. And we know that manual assessment skills are not what we like to think they are. They're not reliable. They're not valid. We're not feeling what we think we feel. There's clear data on this. But this is still how we're trained. It's how I was trained. And what if someone thinks if I bend over like that woman I described earlier, she really does believe that and it's a scary life for her. If I bend over that bulging disc that's already bulging, it's, it's going to burst. It's going to fly out of my spine. How many people themselves have tight hamstrings? And so if a clinician or multiple professionals have said, you have really tight hamstrings, 
or gym teacher said that to you. And then someone connected those dots and said, because of the tight hamstrings, your back is now in pain. I know people, people I love, who say, my hamstrings have always been tight. So they might then naturally conclude they're destined for pain the rest of their lives. So I think it's probably clear why we should start talking differently about these things. In 2007, the same year that the cold metal rod study was released, Lorimer Mosley, the author of that study and the author of the two books I've listed already, put out this paper titled Reconceptualizing Pain According to Modern Pain Science. And there are several principles he laid out in this. It's a nicely written paper. He's one researcher who, who writes for clinicians. He is a clinician himself. He's a physical therapist who went and got an, a PhD in neuroscience and has since done quite a lot of research in pain. And he still practices in the clinic. Pain doesn't provide a measure of the state of tissues, right? That's one tenant. So tissue issues and pain issues, not the same thing. Number two, pain is modulated by many factors from across somatic, psychological, and social domains. So here we are to biopsychosocial model, but really talking about how these factors don't just influence each other, but they directly modulate pain. When I was going through my shoulder issue, during the peak of all that pain, before the MRI probably calmed my, my nerves down a bit, um, I was... I didn't realize this until my husband said something. I was in the kitchen and I was doing the dishes and I was in my own frustrated world. And he said, you know, you don't have to demonstrate that you hurt. I know you hurt. And I didn't realize I was doing this. You know, those pain behaviors are just naturally built in. That's how we seek help and signal that we need help. But what I then started to pick up on was when I was at work, I didn't do that stuff. Probably because I work with a team of clinicians who respect this process and use this kind of language and we all speak the same this, the same language with our patients and maybe there was something that I needed to do subconsciously at home to demonstrate that I was in trouble more so than at work. I can't make sense of it entirely but I know there was a difference. We know that the relationship of pain uh, between pain and the state of the tissues does become less predictable over time and this is another key element to educate patients about this sensitization principle sensitization or sensitivity and this is what you'll hear well last year I could sit and drive to the, to the clinic it took about 45 minutes but now I can't sit in the car for more than three minutes or I used to be able to watch a movie and I can't get through a movie I can't sit that long or I used to work on my car but now I can't even do the dishes so this sensitization, the threshold is changing, getting more sensitive over time, and what we do with our body does not relate to how much pain we have, especially the longer people are living with pain. And the last one, pain can be conceptualized as a conscious correlate of the implicit perception that the tissues are in danger. So threat value. And we're going to hear later about trauma and the impacts of trauma on our physiology. And I think it's really important that we all start considering pain as a representation of how that person is feeling threatened on any level. And so those same people who would be able to walk comfortably through the parking lot and then limp in the office, their brains may perceive more threat in that environment. And I say things like that to my patients before I do a physical exam. I will say, look, our brains are programmed to look out for anything that might cause us some trouble, and that includes me. So I'm about to put my hands on your body, I just want you to know. But think about the lighting where you work. Think about the noises where you work. Recognize if you're doing a subjective exam and there's some construction going on, how does that impact your patient's ability to focus on what you're saying? Those brains are, are processing a lot of things that we can't see. So the main ideas here, pain in the brain. This is what I talk about with patients. Nervous system is king, I said in the beginning. The tissue problem and the pain problem may not be the same thing at all. You know, it's ideal if our alarm system tells us when we've been damaged. That's great. But you also know that that doesn't always happen. Gave this talk yesterday and there was someone who had, turns out, ruptured her Achilles tendon with no symptoms at all and went to the doctor and because she had no pain they didn't do a workup perhaps I don't know why but that's what happened and she just limped around for a few days and it didn't give but she couldn't obviously her ankle wouldn't work right so her nervous system didn't give her pain enough to warrant more investigation that's also a problem but they're not the same thing and that's an important concept 
And thoughts are nerve impulses too. That's a quote that comes from the Ex Explain Pain book, and I think this resonates with patients, that thoughts and emotions have physical, chemical consequences. We can't separate mind and body, and we shouldn't try. So it's been long known, 1993, Flood and that group did uh, some investigation on mechanisms that actually alter musculoskeletal pain. And they discovered changing pain, the patient's understanding of the disorder, just that difference in knowledge can change how the body operates. And I think we know this implicitly, but, but sometimes we forget when we have someone in front of us who's saying, I have 13 out of 10 pain. And you think, it's only a 10 scale, it doesn't, it's not possible. But what are they actually trying to tell you? That they're in distress and they don't know how else to express it because that scale is not a very valuable tool, in my opinion. I'm rather disrespectful of that scale when I talk with patients. Sorry, we have to use a stupid 10 scale, but can you tell me what you're feeling? So physiological response, we know this changes, right? But I think our patients need to know this changes too. We know that, um, now the posture literature, this is why I've abandoned the idea of my training, which was posture assessments really tell you a lot about the person's pain problem, and if you can fix their posture, their pain should change, right? That works in some people, but why? We know that uh, our movement changes, but is our movement changing in response to pain, or are the movement changes driving pain? See, I was sort of trained that the movement in posture drives pain, but I think the opposite is the case. I have a pet peeve, uh, back pain cases that get sent to me and uh, core stabilization is the number one request. That's another thing that's sort of a myth that we need to strengthen. In fact, physiologically, the area that is in distress and that the brain is worried about most will most likely have the most protection. Muscles will guard and splint around a spine segment. So that segment is less likely to move around than any other. But we kind of teach the opposite. You need to get your muscles strong to help your back. That's what patients hear from doctors I work with. So focusing on desired aspects, this is something we can definitely do with education, helping patients to calm down about the meaning of the pain. Like my arm, when it resurged a year and a half after the fact, that didn't have a distressing meaning, even though it was a very unpleasant ses uh, sensation in my body. I wasn't distressed by it. So how do we help our patients be less distressed? In the work that I do, a lot of times people will still, at the end of a 12-week rehab, pain rehab program, they will say their pain is still about a 6 out of 10 on the rating scale, but I'm doing what I want to do and it doesn't bother me so much anymore. So it's distress and suffering that I think we need to target, not so much this number. Mediating anxiety is really important. There's plenty of research about brain changes with anxiety and depression and, and how that impacts our physiology, chemistry. Motivation to participate. Now, this is an interesting part of pain neuroscience education research, too. And I imagine that patients you work with, if you try to refer out and you, you know how much Im how important rehab is or you know how important movement is or you want them to get to yoga, but they just don't want to go. You know, we might label that lazy or unmotivated, and, and I think there's more to it. Our brains can also zap motivation for a number of reasons um, that has nothing to do with laziness. In fact, I train my patients to stop using that word with themselves. So now time for a case study and a multi-center study. You're, you're going to have access to all these slides except for the next two, only because I had permis permission from the author to show in a conference setting but not to distribute widely. So this is um, from Adrian Lau and his group. Um, this is the same guy who said patients want to know about pain, they don't want an anatomy lesson. So this is a 31-year-old and a picture of her MRI where you can see some disc material encroaching on the spinal canal. And she's a dancer, she's a professional dancer. This image was taken 48 hours before she was set to have a spine surgery to address the pain. And when she had her pain, it most often was with extension of the spine. Now, think back to meaning and context. Like, what does that mean if she can't extend because pain's getting in the way? That's a really important maneuver to do when you're a dancer. So if that goes away, her professional career might be at risk. 
So here's an fMRI. Now, we have to take a lot of these scans with a, with a grain of salt. I'm going to give you that. But I think this is an interesting one. This is her brain. Row number one is when she's resting in the scanner and she's got a comfortable position. So this lady doesn't have pain 100% of the time. It's only with certain movements. But it had gone on for long enough that she's now in line for surgery. So top row, she's resting comfortably. Second row, they say, do the thing that hurts. And if you're reading this, painful spine movements prior to TNE here stands for therapeutic neuroscience education. That's the term for pain science education, pain neuroscience education, all interchangeable. Um, but TNE is what Adrian Lau and his group use most. So this second row is her brain and all the different brain regions in that moment where she's extending her spine and she's experiencing a lot of pain. So they take her out of the scanner and they give her 30 minutes, only 30 minutes of education about pain science and they put her back in and say, do the same thing you just did that hurt. And her brain has quieted down quite a bit. And she experiences less pain. So brains can change that fast. Our brains are always learning and always changing. But for most of the people, if they've been living with pain for decades, or learned and got reinforced in a lot of deep set beliefs about their bodies, this doesn't happen in a 30, 30 minute visit, but, um, but it can take some patience and persistence for others. So this is an interesting multi-center study, also um, driven by the same group. And they, you can see the regions around the country where these surgical centers were pooling patients. So they collected 64. Now that's not a high N, but I imagine it's difficult to collect people that fit actually into all the parameters they needed. So they um, took all these measures at the bottom. They, they had the patients rate their low back pain. These patients also had leg pain. They took a fear avoidance measure questionnaire. They had cat catastrophizing questionnaire. They did a pain knowledge quiz. So there is a such thing as pain science questionnaire. Um, Osrestry measure for low back pain was taken pre and post. Um, and then they looked at surgery experiences. What did these people think about their experience of the surgery? How satisfied were they? They took the, all these measures preoperatively. They took them again at one month, again at three months, again at six months, and then again at 12 months. I'm amazed that they got this much data out of these people because I can't get my patients to report back six months later one time. So, so here, uh, here's the outcomes. Now, at the one year follow-up, which really the long-term data matters the most for chronic pain states, at the one year outcome uh, data, they were able to show superior results for the education group, but not statistically significant. But what matters most here is that the satisfaction with the surgical intervention was significantly higher. The green is the education group, and these are a bunch of different questions they were asked. And more importantly, the group that had the pain science education had 45% less accumulative cost in terms of healthcare utilization. So that's the kind of stuff that matters a lot to payer systems, health plans. You know, why are we not doing this more? So what does this entail? What is included in pain neuroscience education? I'm going to give you the full Monty. Yeah, take a minute. See, they have their clothes on, so you can't probably recognize them. <laughs> okay, so the crux of this. Now, there are papers that will lay this out for you if you'd like to do a search, and they're all referenced for you. Um, but the meat, the meat of this kind of education is on the next two slides. So the way I've constructed my education sessions, I have variable lengths of them depending on how I can fit them into my clinic, but the, the one that is most comprehensive, I offer a once a month workshop. Once a month I do a two hour workshop where I structure, it's not um, entirely me lecturing, but I do a lot of, I, I give a pain science quiz pre and post, we go through all those answers. I um, show a couple videos to help orient people a little differently towards this subject matter. And then I go through the nitty gritty and I give a lot of metaphors and examples to explain these concepts of nociception, nociceptive pathways. What is this nociceptor? And I say, it's not a pain signal. It's not a pain sensor. It's a danger receptor, danger messages. Your tissues are programmed to activate when certain dangerous or potentially dangerous tissues or stimulation is received in the tissues, right? So something too hot or too cold, something too high pressure or too high tension will activate nociceptors or chemical receptors are on these guys too. And we talk about the kinds of chemicals that activate nociceptor cells. So then we talk spinal inhibition and facilitation. I do teach about inhibitory pathways, descending inhibition, and I teach about um, upregulation at the spinal cord level. And then we talk in terms of what that means, the peripheral sensitization, something gets more sensitive on purpose, that's protective. But it happens centrally too, and that's where things go sideways. 
Plasticity of the brain is a really important thing. Patients need to know that things can change. Nociceptors replace themselves every three to five days. So we have an opportunity to retrain and retrain. That also means you can't just do this home activity once a week. You gotta do it often, okay? So this is where we start hooking more into motivation and participation, because there's a reason why. So I really try hard to not reference anatomical models, and often what you'll hear me say with patients is, look, after the evaluation, after the subjective inf information has been exchanged, after I've done a full chart review, and I can confidently say this is a pain problem, not a tissue problem anymore, I make sure to let them know you may have knee pain and shoulder pain and neck pain, but we're actually treating your nervous system. That's the target. And a psychologist friend of mine uses this a little differently when she helps people understand um, or make sense of the process they've gone through in the medical system. She'll say something like, you know, I hear that you've gone through all of those things and they didn't work and that's really frustrating, but it sounds to me like they were not targeting the right thing. We got to find the right target. Once you have that, you'll do better. So we don't talk about the emotional or behavioral aspects of pain too much because, again, this is stigmatizing. I'm not trying to say that pain is in your head and that gets heard a lot. So if you, if you start doing this, and I hope that you do, just be prepared. My very best efforts, those I'm most proud of in my education sessions, can sometimes end up with me checking what they've heard me say. So you say it's all in my head, that's what I get. No, no, let me start over. That's what happens a lot. So. Um, I have a lot of metaphors and examples that I'm going to share with you, uh, and I do some hand drawings and have things ready. So here's the important bit. This kind of education is not necessary for everybody. It's not necessary for everybody to give the full Monty here, okay? But I think some of the language I've incorporated all along in, in this morning's talk is necessary to start changing the dialogue and using more consistent non-threatening language when we describe things that may be happening in the body. Um, but it's really key that you first, before you launch into any sort of education like this, you, you have to assess this person's damage beliefs. And in my assessment, a lot of what I do is, is help my team understand whether this person would be a good candidate for a, re a pain rehab program. And I do a lot of damage belief assessments. And the people who do best in pain rehab are those who have some willingness to change their beliefs. It's not that others don't do well, but it's a lot more work for the clinicians to get those folks with the set, set in beliefs to a better place. But damage beliefs, what do I mean by that? So I ask my patients, what do you think is going on? What keeps your pain going for this long? And if they get defensive and say, I don't know, you're the doctor. Okay, that tells me one thing. If they say, I have no idea, I'm scared. That tells me another thing. I can have a different approach with that person. Or if they say, well, I mean, you've seen the MRI, haven't you? Okay, let's work on that. <laughs> Okay, so what do you think would help you get better? This is another thing. This gives me a clue as to how actively they, they might be involved in their care. And again, active engagement is really a, a measure of long-term outcome. Self-efficacy, strength is what shows to be the best indicator of long-term benefit of any intervention that you give. Um, so what do you think you need to get better? And I get surprising answers here. A lot of people will level with you and they say, I just think I need to move, but I don't know how. I know I need to exercise, but I can't, it hurts. Or some people will say, I need a surgery. And then I know, you know what? I might not have any luck with this person if their belief system is that they need something taken out or fixed or put in. You know, I, I'm, I'm realistic that way. I may not be able to help that person at this point in time. And so give yourselves a break too. Don't just think you have to change things for everyone. And I think it's important that you establish a relationship that's therapeutic, have an alliance with your patients before you launch into something like this, because it is challenging. And when adults, or children probably, but adults more so, when our beliefs get challenged, we don't respond very well. Even professionally educated, perhaps more so professionally educated adults don't respond very well. I mean, you think about the number of years and the number of dollars we've invested in our education, and then to have someone say, well, that's not right, that doesn't feel good, it didn't feel good to me, but I was also able to say, you know, this provides me with new hope. I didn't think I could help people, but now I think there is a, a, something I could do differently. So just a summary, I'm not gonna go through all of this, it's just here on the slide deck, so when you look back, you, you don't have to take copious notes. 
And a colleague of mine in the Department of Defense is another physical therapist, and he um, has advanced degrees and fellowship training in manual therapy. And here is the thing we all need to remember when we're challenging our belief systems as clinicians. Just because what you were trained may not match on to pain science doesn't mean you have to throw it out, right? You can still do all the things you do, but maybe talk about why it works a little differently. So in the realm of manual therapy, that patient who I saw who was told by another professional, you've got some torsion in your pelvis and we're gonna do this maneuver, and then she felt better in 10 minutes, now she believes that the maneuver is what helped. So all I said to her was, look, I recognize that that really helped you and I'm so glad it did, but let's talk a little bit about why it helped because here's what I can tell you about the research that says clinicians can't really feel what they think they're feeling, chiropractic adjustments don't actually shift the position of spines when we take pre and post immediately. We know that subluxation does, it's, we gotta challenge these beliefs based on the science that we have, but the reason why these help, the reason is that your nervous system got some novel input got some reassuring touch, got some reinforcement that movement is safe, and then it learned to do something differently and you had a positive experience. That's why it helps. So keep doing the stuff you do, just talk about it differently. Crossing that chasm is not easy, right? It takes practice for us too. It took me several years to finally be comfortable approaching education sessions like this, but you have to jump in and try or else you'll never get anywhere. So that's the end of my part. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm glad you're all standing up and taking care of your bodies. Thank you. <laughs> About the guy who's walking easily in the parking lot and limps in your office. Right. And you implied that that's not malingering and I think a lot of us would disagree but don't understand why neuroscience says it's not malingering. What I meant or what I hope I said instead was that we shouldn't presume that that person is malingering, that instead we should consider that that person's brain is evaluating threat in those two environments differently and we know that pain changes the way we move, we know that pain changes the way we hold ourselves and these are not necessarily conscious things. So I can see in the look on your face that you're not there with me. And remember what I said, I'm gonna challenge your beliefs, right? I'm okay with that. I love the question, it's good. You have another one? Yeah. Okay. Um, you implied that strengthening the front and side muscles will yep. not help protect an injured back. Oh, is that what you heard me imply, that strengthening wouldn't help protect? Well, you said, oh. you know, we all tell the physical therapist to work on core strength. Core, core stabilization as and, an intervention for back pain, right. Yeah, but you kind of implied that that's not valid. So, thank you for bringing that up. What I said was, that's a pet peeve of mine when that uh, patient with back pain gets referred for core stabilization. The presumption is that, and I've heard physicians in my group say this too, you need to strengthen your back to help your pain. There's just no clear evidence that that's the case. We know that some people in persistent pain states actually have higher activation of tonic muscle activity at rest. Not everybody, but some do. And that even those who have a normal resting rate of activity in their trunk muscles have a higher rate of activation when they're doing regular life activities. Now human movement is efficient when the minimal amount of muscle activation is, is at work. So I just think this notion that saying you need to strengthen your back to help your back implies that there's weakness or vulnerable, vulnerability. And that I disagree with. And so to think that core stabilization is the way to go for every person with back pain isn't accurate. That's all I meant to say. Yep. Great. We Hi. Um, I actually have a comment um, in relationship to perception and pain. And this may is something maybe you're going to cover later, but there was a classic study done probably 30 years ago um, that held the hands of um, a certain number of people in very cold water, mm -hmm. timed how long it could last, and then they went to a three-month meditation retreat and did that same exercise. And I don't remember the numbers, but it was 
very significantly longer. Yeah. And so it does speak that this again may be covered, but to the brain's relationship to perception of pain. That's, that's great. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And I won't cover that specific study later, and, but it reminds me of one that's also not in the slide presentation, um, using a blood pressure cuff to measure how people tolerate deep pressure. And the script that they're told before, uh, and I could get this reference for you, I don't have it in my head, but the script that they're told before uh, the activity, before the test, really changes the outcome. So the group that's told this is going to cause some sort of damage if you do it too long, they don't hold as long, they don't sustain that or with, um, uh, withstand it as long as the group that's told the longer you hold this, the longer you deal with this pressure around your arm, the stronger your, the stronger your bicep muscles will be. So this idea that our brain, it's not an idea, it's a concept, it's, it's a phenomenon, it's what our brain does. It shifts the perception and changes the pain threshold or the tolerance to pain. There's a question up front. Uh, congruent with that, I was reviewing recent uh, research about set and setting. and They've been doing some new research with psychotherapy and LSD. And that research is really moving quite rapidly right now. Mm -hmm. And they're exploring the idea of set and setting around death and dying and also recovery from addiction. And what they found with the functional MRI studies is that when we use a therapeutic like this, it allows the brain to decompartmentalize and reorganize. They use the metaphor, when we do LSD, we end up with baby brains which allow us to break down the compartments and reorganize the material again mm -hmm. to establish new beliefs with new outcomes. Mm -hmm. So I just want to, I know it's a little wacky, but this <laughs> idea of set and setting is really, really critical yeah. to uh, neurological formation and neurological health. And the research is, is documenting that quite uh, robustly recently. Right, thank you. Um, I'm curious if there's much research having to do with um, comparing pain that is induced by yourself, like in an injury, and pain that's sustained due to someone else injuring you. Ah. Uh, research comparing self-inflicted self or something that happened um, without anyone else around versus... Say someone who drinks and drives and injures yeah. themselves. You know, I bet you could, I don't know off the top of my head, but I bet you could find some uh, literature in the realm of forgiveness and, uh, and the elements that, you know, the brain hangs on to and blame, I don't, I can't quote anything, but I have had uh, enough anecdotal experiences where people's pain change from one, one example that comes to mind is a woman I treated with whiplash in my first year of working, and uh, at the time my husband was working for an insurance company, so I got all the ins and outs of what insurance adjusters go through, the other side of that coin. You know, we normally were on the side where we're trying to get money for claims for things that have happened to us. So I had empathy for the insurance adjusters, that was just my pers perspective at the time, and so this woman had been rear-ended by a police officer, and Session after session, I saw her seven times, and each and every time she told me, well, what we did last time helped for about a day, and then we'd be right back to it. And about session number eight or nine, I decided to keep trying, I, after seven sessions of no lasting improvement, I changed the tack. But during sessions eight and nine, I was talking with her about her frustrations while I was doing whatever I was doing with manual therapy and other modalities or whatever I did. Uh, and and. I realized that she was really having a hard time with the process, the system that was impeding what she needed to do to feel healthy. She, w she had financial constraints and she needed payments that weren't coming and she was very blaming of all the, and presumptive of what the people in the insurance company are definitely doing, they don't care about me, they're just ignoring me or all this stuff. And so I helped her to have a different perspective, I thought, I said, you know, my husband does this and here's what I can tell you about every day in his work life and how much pressure he's got and maybe there's no intention at all of, you know, putting your case aside but they may not have a choice, they're so overwhelmed that they're doing the best they can. And, um, and in that same conversation we talked about whether or not she keeps thinking about the police officer who in fact apologized, had done the day of, and I asked whether she had forgiven him. And she said, no, I didn't even think about it. And I said, well, maybe, maybe it's worth thinking about. Now, this is all anecdotal, but the very next time she came in, she reported being 50% better the entire week. 
That wasn't anything I did with my hands. I don't believe that. I still don't. Something changed in her awareness and in her thought process, and I think that's a, a valid point worth looking into the research, and, and I wish I could quote something more direct. I was curious um, how you talk to your patients about substance abuse, and I guess in two sit scenarios, one is the patient who maybe having to use high-dose opiates so they don't feel, I'm not an addict, or they're very sensitized to that, the stigma there, or what about a patient who is engaging in concerning, you know, drinking or using behavior related to their pain? Yeah, so I'm going to show you uh, a little later on in the practical applications portion, just a handout that I have, and, and it will be made available, not tomorrow, and it, probably Monday or Tuesday I can send the PDF so it can be posted. But we use a um, little half, or it's an eight and a half by 11 sheet folded in half, little bifold thing that patients take away, that after educating someone about the nervous system, and, the, and, you know, persistent pain states, you can do this briefly. On the back of this bifold pamphlet, I've got a couple different boxes. The goal here is treating the nervous system. So what are we doing in our life choices that upregulate or activate or sensitize? And what are we doing to calm it down? So among the list of what sensitizes include things like alcohol, PTSD, uh, no exercise, sedentary lifestyle, bad sleep, all these things that people recognize they could tick off in their own life. Um, so my first approach, it depends on how well I know the person in terms of what I say to them, but my first approach would be just global information and let them pick out what might apply. They don't even have to talk to me about it. Um, but then in the same sheet of paper, what can you do to change your nervous system? There are things you can start doing to change your lifestyle. And then we might talk about, you know, what services our healthcare system provides to help support that. So I work closely with psychologists and substance use disorder treatment um, programs. And so, you know, we might, we might be able to talk about if somebody's interested in pursuing more and getting help, then we can go to the next step. If they recognize first that some choices they make, um, even if they don't feel like choices, some choices they make or behaviors they have are actually adding to the pain problem. If they can make that connection, then there's more traction to build some sort of alliance and, and treatment engagement. It's really hard. Any other question? So um, it seems like every time we want to change health culture, and I think we need to change health culture around this topic because yeah. We have been doing it wrong, and what you're saying, I think, is true. We have to change our words, and then and so yeah. we say, well, we're not going to say pain. We're going to call it nervous system. Tell me if I, I want to make sure I do this right. So I, I, I hope I, you didn't hear me say, don't ever right. say pain again. <laughs> well, but we're going to try <laughs> no, to avoid pain saying signal, that. Pain signal, pain pathway, pain center of the brain, that, those words, those phrases, yes. Th those phrases yeah. cause people to start kind of getting locked into these pain ideas that are dysfunctional. It's so my belief that we need that to, could We be need true. to work yeah. on new w language. And, yes. I'm, and if I understand you right, we should be saying nervous system danger signals. And yeah. Okay. So I'm trying to translate that into Spanish because it sounds a lot ah. like, to me like nervios, oh, which is an anxiety <laughs> disorder. And it's like, oh, you're telling me yeah. this is nervios again. And I, I don't think that's... And it's, it's, so, it's a great point. It's a really important point that cultural sensitivity changes all of this. And language is so meaningful for all of us. If you look at um, the common terminology we use in our US American culture for headaches, describing headache pain, what do we normally say? It's like a vice grip, an ice pick. It's squeezing from the inside. There's like a nail behind my eye. These things are very visual, rich imagery that's rather threatening, right? You look at the Japanese culture and they have very different descriptors for headache pain. They say things like it's a crab walk headache or a bear stomp headache. And so it's important to recognize what the meaning of the language, uh, the words in whatever language is that you're working in. That's so important. I personally don't speak Spanish, so I wouldn't know how to help you translate that. But perhaps you could utilize someone in a Spanish speaking community to get the concept across to maybe work on a different language collection for that group of patients. That's really great. It's so important and hard. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. First was when you were describing that you have this two hour course, you were saying that it's not for everyone. The first question is, well, then who is it for? <laughs> who, who are you selecting to participate in that? Yeah. And the second question is related to the patients that are looking for the comfort of the person who's going to write their opiate therapy, right? I mean, because I have patients that are shopping and 
moving to different doctors and one doctor is talking about taking them off the medication and that's causing them more anxiety. Yeah. So how do you deal with that part of their culture in this? Yeah, context? that's exactly the language that I use and that my colleagues use. That uh, once we've established this idea that um, anything that affects the the stress management that your nervous system has to do will affect pain. That's sort of a take home message that things that you do in your life will affect your nervous system and that can modulate pain. That there is a connection that what you're doing every day actually um, in the service of trying to reduce pain may be acting as an amplifier. Um, so it works best when you have a team of people saying the same thing. Um, we, we work closely with primary care providers and a specific team in primary care that's designated as, a, as an intensive pain team. They call themselves integrated pain team. So they do a lot of work around educating people about why it's important to have, I suppose, a medical home or a, you know, a group of people they can rely on and build relationships with so they can feel safe and, and move forward and help each other figure out how, how to best care for the individual. Um, and we're going to talk a little later about, you know, how you introduce this idea of multimodal care and why that's important. But um, one thing that a particular primary care provider uses a lot is, is a concept put out by the American um, Chronic Pain Association. The American Chronic Pain Association, Penny Cowan is the CEO and president of that company and she has wonderful resources available. And there's a little video about four minutes long on the website, the, on her website you can find it. it's called the, car with four flat tires. And I have a little spongy, you know, stress ball shaped car that's in the same shape of this cartoon thing on her website. I have it in my office and sometimes I'll pull that out and I'll say, look, I know you're struggling and it's really hard and, and they, they may have just come from a frustrating visit with the primary care team who was laid down some boundaries and they didn't like it. And I say, no, it's frustrating and it's really scary, but this hasn't been, it hasn't been fair to you. You've only been taught one thing to do for your pain and there's more that you can learn. And that's not right to only have one tool. So uh, having chronic pain is like a car with four flat tires. And it doesn't get very far, but if you only fill up one of the tires with medication, you still don't get very far. What are you gonna do to fill up those other tires? Let's talk about that. I heard some ooze over there, that was, yep. So that's a start um, and to answer the first question about who do I, whom do I select, um, I don't have the luxury of selecting most of the time. In fact, the two-hour workshop that I do, I open that up. It's a walk-in group. It's a walk-in class. I get random referrals. I, I don't know them from Adam. I don't know their medical history. All I know is that their provider sent them because they have chronic pain and they're struggling. Uh, so the way I've structured that is to be as global and respectful as I can and to recognize that I'm challenging things they may have heard before um, or I'm giving them some new way to think about it. When I select people, because I do actually in, um, evaluate individual patients and then make the suggestion that they come to that two-hour workshop, those people I select if I've assessed their willingness to hear things differently. So in a one-on-one -on -one session in 10 minutes or something, if I do a little teaching, which I'll show you later on and how I do it, and then I ask them, what did you hear? What did you hear me say? And if they say something like, well, I've never heard anything like that before, and this actually f seems like there's hope, awesome, send them. Or if they say, you know, I'm thinking about that. That's, I don't know what to think yet. I'm going to think about it. Then I'll send them. <laughs> or if they, if they absolutely say, I, you just saying it's all in my head, then I'll say, okay, well, I didn't do a very good job of educating you today, and I'm sorry, and that's on me, but I think you can be better, and you don't have to live your life like this the rest of your days. It can be better, so let's try again next time. Please come back. That's what I tell them. So, you know, there, it's, it's kind of a mixed platter, but um, some of the research studies that have really delved into this pain science education have shown that individual sessions work a little better than group sessions. But I also will tell you that in group sessions I've had some really wonderful light bulbs go off because like in this room, people don't always come up with examples to demonstrate these concepts like tissue damage without pain. Um, they may not come up with it in a one-on-one -on -one situation, but in a group, someone else will come up with a great example, and now it's another patient saying something instead of a clinician in a position of authority saying something. That's more powerful in my experience, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of ways that I can repeat some 
some sort of research to see that group work actually is beneficial too, to the same power, because that's more applicable in our work envi environment. We can actually disseminate group classes much more easily than one-on-one -on -one education. Yeah, I hope that answers your question somewhat. Eh, we'll talk later. Yeah. Have you had any experience tying your uh, group sessions into a pain management agreement with the PCP? Not yet. The question, if you didn't hear, is do, we t do I have an experience um, tying together education like this with like an opioid contract, a pain, a pain care agreement, or however you term that? Um, no, I think it could have some value, um, and I would kind of love that, but I also think we're still too entrenched in, in stigmas around opioid contracts that it would feel punitive. You have to go to this, and we know adult learning theory tells us if you're not willing to be there and you're not interested, you're not going to absorb anything new. So I'm not sure that would be an effective way to utilize this vehicle. Um, but we are, I, I do have colleagues and I am playing around with the idea of having like a, like a menu approach. Um, Karen's going to talk a little about the programs that she's developed and the, having a menu, like, hey, you've got four flat tires, you have to choose three things off this list that you're going to fill it with. That might work. Um, and, and I think it would be great. I think if we could pair those together and not have it feel like a punishment um, or must do this in order to get that, I know that's not successful. We've had patients who enroll in our program and they say, well, I'm only here because my doctor won't give me my meds if I don't come. That doesn't work ever. Thank you time. so much. Thank okay. you for your questions and for your interest. Yeah.